Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Well done for making it here for the first session of the day. I'm very impressed. Um, my name's Phil, and I'm here to talk about improving player retention in your game by winning back lapsed players. Before we start, I've been asked to remind you to please put your devices on silent. Um, please remember to fill out the survey that will be sent around at the end. It's uh, really good feedback for me, as well as the conference organizers. And um, remember, the slides from the talk will be on the GDC vault. And if you want them a bit quicker, you can email me uh, as well. The details will be on there at the end as well. My talk today is going to try and answer these questions. What is a returner? Why are they important? How can you get more of them back to your game and then increase your chances of keeping them? I've written this talk mainly for game designers working on live games, but I hope it will be useful for people in similar roles like producers or product managers. Now, fair warning, there is a little bit of marketing woven in there as well, and this is because I wanted to make sure I covered the full journey of a returning player. I also thought it could be useful for smaller or indie studios who have to do a bit of everything themselves. So a few words about myself. I'm the head of the RuneScape studio at Jagex, and we're an online games developer and publisher based in Cambridge in England. And uh, I don't really get to do much hands-on design these days, but I've worked in design roles for about 17 years, started as a design assistant at Bullfrog, progressed to be a lead while at Sony, and then at Jagex I've become executive producer and then later studio head. I've always loved playing online games, especially RPGs, so it's been really fantastic to be able to lead a large MMO like RuneScape. In doing this, I've needed to learn a lot about running online games and games as a service, and I hope I can share some of what I've learned with you guys here today. I'm going to be using RuneScape as a case study throughout the talk, so I'll give uh, a bit of a breakdown of what it's all about. RuneScape is a traditional fantasy MMORPG. It's quite different from other games in the genre because it mixes a sandboxy open world with a lot of storytelling and quests. Oops, there we go. The original version was launched all the way back in 2001, and we've updated it pretty much weekly ever since. That's to add new content, improve the graphics, and even update the technology behind the game. It was one of the first free-to-play games around, and the business model has always been evolving. Um, it's a bit of a hybrid now. The, game, the basic game is free. There's an optional subscription if you want access to tons more content, and there's optional microtransactions for cosmetic items and boosts. We've got 160 development and publishing staff working on the game, but in addition to the main RuneScape game, we have other products in the franchise. There's a retro server that we call Old School RuneScape. We have a mobile companion app, currently developing a CCG called Chronicle RuneScape Legends, and we're also starting to work on a new RuneScape MMO. So if we quickly cover our players, most of them are male, aged between 16 and 26, and although we have a number of localized versions of the game around the world, it's the English one that's the most popular. Retention is our speciality, because over half of our current active players have been playing for over six years. And they're really dedicated as well, with an average session length of over 90 minutes, and about half of our players play every day. We're also really blessed to have a very active fan community, especially in video and live streaming, and the game is regularly in the top 10 on Twitch. I'm always fascinated by stats from other people's games, so I thought I'd return the favor and uh, share some of our uh, commercial metrics. In terms of lifetime revenues, we're now very close to ticking over the three quarters of a billion dollar mark. Our daily active user count is between five and 600,000, so depending on the day of the week. Our monthly active users is just over two million. We have over 600,000 subscribers. It's uh, 619,000 as of this morning. And that's been gradually growing for the last uh, couple of years. Our average concurrent users is around 60,000, and that peaks to 90,000 in the evenings or at the weekends. And when we run special events, it can go up to about 120, 130,000 players online at once. I hope these are pretty healthy stats, and I think it shows that along with games like World of Warcraft, who've also been growing their subscriptions in recent years, that MMOs can have really, really long tails, uh, almost becoming evergreen games. But to achieve that, a game's retention has got to be really good. And not just focusing on keeping players, but finding ways to get lapsed players to return. So what is a returner? 
this is my definition, it's someone who comes back to your game after a sustained lapse from regular play. And I say regular play because I'm not including those who've only briefly tried the game and bounced straight off. I think, as you'll see, they're not gonna be relevant for your attention. For RuneScape, we determine if a player has lapsed based on a duration of three months, and we base that off whether they've been out of the membership subscription. Now, this is different from what most games will do. It's because our game's a bit different. It's quite a long-form experience, and the subscription, for us, ultimately, is the most important thing, and that's why, in this case, we use it as the measure of engagement. The more standard approach that makes sense for most people is a lapse duration of over a month, and um, that's based on the player being inactive during that time, and that's what I'd recommend for most people. So why should you even bother trying to attract returners? Well, compared to a new player, a returner is going to be easier to acquire. That's because they feel a lot less of the friction that a new player will experience when they come into a game for the first time. Former players will know roughly what's on, all, uh, what's on offer, so their expectations are going to match. They will understand the fundamentals of the game already, should have already invested a good amount of time in it, hopefully remember enjoying it, and they may already be past that all-important first payment barrier as well. This should all mean that the cost to reacquire a lapsed player should be lower than that of a brand new player. When we average all of RuneScape's user acquisition spend last year, the cost per paying user for lapsed players was $3, and for new players, it was $3.80, which for us makes the reacquisition route around 25% less expensive for a similar lifetime value. Returners are gonna become more relevant to you over time. As the game gets older, getting new players in is gonna to become tougher, but the number of lapsed players you'll have, of course, is gonna be increasing. So it, there'll be a shift in their relative importance. And um, in this chart, you can see how this has happened for RuneScape, with the proportion of incoming returning members, which is shown in red, increasing from half to two-thirds over four years. So it's gradual, but it's significant. It's true that the longer a player has been away, the harder it will be to win them back, but I still say that long-term lapses are still really viable for you. And here's a bit of proof. This chart shows RuneScape's incoming members for all of last year, broken down by the amount of time they've been away. The largest group, you can see right at the bottom, um, they've been away for over a year. Now our game is a bit of an extreme case because it's been around for a very long time, but you should still get the sense of the potential you can have from long-term lapsed players. We still get people returning to the game with absences of over 10 years. RuneScape owes a lot to returning players. The majority of our current active players have at some point lapsed for at least three months. So two thirds, almost two thirds of our players are already counted as returners. So you can see how important they can be deep into a game's life cycle. I believe that returners are the key to a game's longevity. Because if you're not gonna be able to retain absolutely everyone and the rate of new players you can get is gonna slowly decrease, your long-term prospects will be dependent on your ability to attract returners. So hopefully you'd agree that there is value in putting attention into returning players, but how are you going to go about doing that? I'll step through the major challenges, and you'll see that they represent the returning player's journey back into the game. Come on. First, you need to find a way to communicate to lapsed players because they're not going to be proactively checking in on your game. Having reached them, you need to grab their interest and motivate them to return. This is tough because you've got to overcome whatever reluctance made them lapse in the first place. And if you can get them to come back, you have to help them get reacquainted with your game. This is, uh, well, sorry, they may have been away for only a month and just need a refresher. They may have been away for years and need a lot more assistance, and that variability is an extra challenge. But hopefully you can get them back and into the swing of things, and now you need to engage their interest for the longer term so you can you know, prevent them from easily churning uh, straight away again. And then looking further ahead, the challenge is to develop a design mindset as you make the game, which embraces returners and considers their specific needs so you can build on these benefits well into the future. These points are gonna be the chapters I'll cover through the rest of the talk, and I'll dive into each in a bit more detail in turn. So that starts with communication, and the first challenge is finding ways to reach out and get a message to lapsed players. 
This will be difficult because they won't be loading your app or visiting your website. Email is probably the most obvious channel for win back messages, but it does have its limitations. This is because engagement rates tend to be low. Um, getting marketing emails from games you don't play anymore can be annoying. Um, so there's a friction problem there as well. And there's a whole bunch of technical risks to deal with, especially if you want to use email at volume. So we found using email to contact laps players has only modest success rates. You can see here that on RuneScape, our win-back emails have around a 16% open rate and under 2% click-through rate. But that's actually not too different from the success rates we see in uh, marketing emails for other games or when sending to active players. It's just, it's just the way it works. But if email isn't enough, what are your other options? I recommend embracing social media and this concept of passive communication. By this, I mean you're not actively pushing messages um, directly at people. You're putting them out there, but you're not forcing them down people's throats. You're allowing people to stay in touch with you, but on their own terms. To specifically target returners, I recommend building a particular social media channel around their needs. Here you're going to want less quantity, but higher interest, higher quality, less of that day-to-day -day community chatter, uh, community trivia, and a focus on the really big and important game updates or events. We found that Facebook and YouTube work particularly well for this because people don't expect you to be filling them with lots of different stuff every day. Twitter, on the other hand, much more fast-moving, more conversational, and I don't think would work as well um, from this perspective. Here you can see a comparison of traffic to our game from different sources. Uh, these are visitors who aren't active players. You can see how the visitors generated by our marketing emails, which is uh, second to the right, are dwarfed by most of the social media channels. And you can see how Reddit really brings us a lot of traffic. So I'll take a slight diversion and talk about Reddit quickly. These are some screen grabs I took on a, a day last month um, now, sorry, from the RuneScape subreddit. This isn't something we run. It's administrated by player volunteers, but we do try and actively support it. As you can see, Reddit seems to attract a lot of players who are just generally curious about games and interested in returning. They kind of want more information or reason to do so. Um, in our subreddit, that came to the point where the admins had to add specific materials for returning players to the uh, subreddit sidebar because they were getting so much interest and questions on this front. So if you're not already working with Reddit, definitely do so. I think that as developers, we can really benefit from fronting our own games and social media. We found that having lots of staff out there talking to players, it gets more followers, it generates more buzz, and it helps build trust. And it shows that you're real people, you're not just a brand, and it invites players to talk with you. So it's a great venue to talk about what you're doing and to get feedback. And then this helps you stay in touch with players when they lapse from your game. Having lots of devs available means there's collectively more followers for your game, and um, lapsing players may stay following an individual developer they have a personal interest in. Players are a fantastic asset when it comes to reaching out to those who've lapsed. If you can build features that help players share content from your game, you're going to cultivate more player advocates and more content creators and that will give your game a bigger reach out to the wider uh, space of gamers. And this means, oh dear, sorry, I pressed the button. Um, and this means lapsed players are more likely to encounter media shared from your game. So there's more chances for it to um, trigger uh, people's interest in your game and in returning. Now, the obvious stuff to do is to create a function in your game that posts the player's latest achievement to Twitter or Facebook. And those things do work, but to be most effective, you should be looking to provide players with a tool set to create their own personal content, something that's unique to them and something they can feel really proud of. We built a few features that have worked well for this, so I'll give you some examples. The first is called the Orb of Oculus. It's nothing to do with Oculus Rift just yet, unfortunately. Um, it's a feature that... Um, puts the game camera into an object that players can control. It essentially decouples the game camera from their player character, allows it to be moved independently. You can hide the game UI, position everything in the scene. So players can set up post screenshots for um, you know, stuff they want to share or allows them to record uh, video clips for their machinima. You can see some examples of some nice post shots players have created on the screen. 
The next example is from our bestry. This is a feature on our website where players can look up the stats of monsters, um, pose them, look at their animations, and for almost no extra effort, we put in this green screen mode, which allows players to much more easily cut out the characters and um, you know, bring them out of the background so they can use them in their own uh, memes on social media or their fan art. So something, you know, tiny, tiny thing that was really useful for players. Um, my last example was a bit more involved, and this was a full integration we did with Twitch. And it allowed players to stream and broadcast straight from the game without needing to install any other software or um, get confused with all the configuration. And it acted as a stepping stone that encouraged players to try out live streaming for minimal effort. You can support your content creators in broader ways as well. We find that a lot of LAPS players still regularly watch the YouTube videos or the uh, broadcasts of their favorite famous players. And if you give your players the tools, the support, and the confidence to share content from your game, they'll help you in reaching out to those who've lapsed. And you can offer a bunch of things to help them with this. A big one is exposure. As a developer, you can push a lot of traffic their way. And this isn't just a community management job either. You can design it into the game. In the Twitch integration I just showed, there's a directory of current streamers for players to uh, click and go and watch. By giving your content creators previews of game features before they're released, they can have something special to show off. We occasionally do private testing of new game features before full release, and we invite video makers to take part in these tests. And for us, it generates a bit more awareness, and for them, it gets exclusive content to put in their videos uh, for them to drive interest themselves. If you're feeling really brave, you can give certain players uh, some of your admin tools. So obviously limited versions of what you might give your community management or uh, game masters, um, made safe, obviously. Um, so for example, we've given some of our live streamers a function where they can spawn a very limited number of rare items to give away in uh, competitions on their stream. And that goes down really well. They're really popular. And it's like a mutually beneficial thing. Overall, though, the best thing your content creators want is gameplay that's as fun to watch as it is to play. Obviously, this is a massive subject and worthy of a whole separate talk, and there are a few on the GDC this week, so um, if you're interested, definitely look into that stuff, because the more viewers your content creators and broadcasters have, the more people are, can keep in touch with your game, even when they're not actively playing themselves. Okay, so on to the next chapter. Now we've got ways to reach out to lapsed players what are we going to do to draw them back, and when's the best time to do it? I've really come to believe that it's possible to design game features that specifically talk to lapsed players. The challenge is to find features that are going to pique their interest. And a great way to do this is to focus on iconic and well-known content. So even if a lapsed player has been away for a while, it's something they'll still remember and a concept they'll still get excited about. I recommend using characters, locations, or game features that players have strong attachments to and are likely to still care about. Another approach is to address their reasons for leaving. You can obviously solve problems like boredom and frustration by adding new features and content. And if some players have left because of a problem in your game, you can, of course, fix the thing that's caused them to leave. We found it really helpful to get inspiration for such features by using analytics and surveys. You can look at historical data and try and find clusters of levers who have similar characteristics. Maybe there's a certain level banding where a disproportionate amount of players have left, and you can dive in, see what's going on, and try and address that. Surveys to lapsed players are also really useful to get a clearer understanding of why they've left and what you could do to motivate them to return. I'll, uh, I'll give you some examples from RuneScape that have worked successfully over the last few years. The first approach is... Um, content that resolves a big cliffhanger. So you should go back to something in your game where players will be curious to see what happens next. We did this in RuneScape last year with, uh, by finishing a 10-year-long quest series, which ended in the opening of a massive lost city. And this was a city that players had seen the outside walls and seen the gates, but never been able to get in. The update was built around this iconic content most players would have played at some point in the past, and in addition to its narrative significance, it also added a lot of content. So when people did come back, they had lots of stuff to do. Another approach is to fix a problem in the game that you think has caused players to leave. A few years ago, we made major changes to the game's combat system, and this alienated a portion of players at the time. 
So last year, we added a legacy mode that, uh, a legacy combat mode that sat alongside the newer one. So those that preferred the traditional combat gameplay and interfaces could go back to using those. It meant that they didn't have to learn completely new systems, and in doing so, it opened the door to a large number of returning players. And this is a topic I'll come back to a bit later in the presentation. Another approach is to go big, do something that's really attention-grabbing, something that's significant in the context of your game, has something fresh and interesting and new about it. We did this with some big world events inside RuneScape back in 2013. These were large-scale but time-limited events that all players across all servers could join in, and their actions decided the fate of a massive god-versus-god battle that took place across the iconic cities of the game world. And it also included a new type of gameplay for RuneScape, free-form, open-world PvP with territory capture. And it was this scale and uh, the interest of the new gameplay concepts that enticed lapsed players back to check it out in quite large volumes. My last example is about playing on the nostalgia factor, tapping into fond memories and offering those experiences to players again. In early 2013, we did a poll to gauge players' interest in having a retro server of RuneScape, a much older build of the game. And for many players, this was their formative experience of online games, and they considered this period in the game's history to be like a golden age. It was a time when things were much simpler, much sparser, and much more difficult. This brought back many hundreds of thousands of players. And even a few years later, it continues to be a small but really dedicated part of our community. We found that the timing of game updates can be just as important as their content. By understanding the activity trends of returners, you can choose the optimal point to publish your game updates when lapsed players are most likely to listen and respond. This chart shows an annual view of the average return rates for RuneScape across the last five years. And you can see clearly there's really big surges in June and July, and then again in September, sorry, in December. And this is because many of our players are college students and they have more free time during the seasonal holidays, and we really see these noticeable differences in early summer and Christmas. We now purposefully attempt to time the release of win-back features to coincide with these uh, expected lifts in seasonal returners. And RuneScape has quite pronounced seasonality across the year, but we also find similar patterns on smaller scales as well. So if we zoom in, these charts show the average return rate across a week. And this time we've split it so you can see the different patterns between off-season and the peak holiday period. So on the left, you can see on the off-season, it's the weekend that has the most returners. But for the peak season during holidays, it's actually Fridays that gets the most. From a marketing perspective, these day-to-day -day patterns are useful when choosing when you want to announce stuff or when you want to pulse advertising, but they're also useful from a design perspective. It really helps decide when's the best times to start and finish your in-game events. So for instance, you're not going to want to end an event just at the time lots of returning people are coming back to the game. So seasonality and activity trends for returners are going to be different for every game, of course. So I recommend you dig into your data, find out when you naturally have more returning players, and build that into your plans. And you don't just have to do big content or feature updates to motivate them. On a smaller scale, we found that holiday and seasonal events like Halloween and Easter are also consistently good at encouraging inactive players to revisit the game. Uh, but for what it's worth, the things, the smaller stuff like Valentine's and July the 4th, while they're good for in-game events, for active players, we've not found them significant enough to bring back more returners. Okay, so next chapter. At this point, we've encouraged lapsed player to return to the game, but they now need to get reacquainted with how to play. And this is particularly challenging because the player remembers they had a mastery of the game, but they don't remember all the details. They can feel like a newbie in veterans' clothing. So you've got to help them overcome this and shortcut them back to becoming this expert. And it's made more difficult by the fact that each returner is different. The longer they've been away, the more they've forgotten, but also the more changes they'll have missed during their absence. So I definitely recommend providing some sort of catch-up learning features targeted or built for returning players. It could be as simple as um, prompting them to replay a cut-down tutorial or turning on some sort of contextual help system. We've tried a range of things on RuneScape, and I'll show you a bad example and then a better one. 
in um, mid-2013, we did a bit of a relaunch of the game under the badge of RuneScape 3, and we added a bunch of new features, uh, content, graphics, a new UI system, and we created this helper feature that popped up when a returning player logged in. It had 11 pages that summarized a whole bunch of changes, and you can probably guess that most players closed it immediately. It didn't grab their attention, and they didn't want to read and memorize all this generic information. So last year, we tried to learn from this and uh, improve on several fronts. We created this learning hub for returning players. It had dynamic elements that looked at the character's level and recommended certain content based on that. It looked at how long the player had been away, and it showed them different catch-up information. And we created a gear guide that recommended the appropriate equipment for the player's level. We also created a range of short but fun catch-up videos that covered a three to 18-month period of content updates, which we'd worked out was the sweet spot for most of our returning players. This all worked much better. Um, we saw it in our commercial performance, and we had a lot of good feedback from returning players about it. So I recommend you try and use the information you've got about each player, um, especially the length of time they've been away, to personalize their relearning process. If you can't do that, always try and make it as relevant, as visual, and as entertaining as possible. And depending on the type of game you've got, it might be worth considering what you can do to lower the barrier uh, for payment for returning players. Several MMOs, including RuneScape, have got tradable premium currency items. Uh, RuneScape's version is called Bonds. World of Warcraft announced they're adding this um, a few days ago. These are items where players can buy them from you for real money. They can trade them between each other and then redeem the item for one of your paid services. In our case, that's mainly the membership subscription. Effectively, it means that your high spenders are subsidizing other players and time-rich players can pay for everything using their in-game wealth. And this is especially relevant for returners because they're likely to be coming back to your game with an account that already has wealth on it. And in our case, they can use this wealth to buy a bond from our auction house or from another player, redeem it for uh, membership or one of our other premium currencies without needing to pay any real money. We introduced this in late 2013 and saw a really significant increase in the number of returning players getting membership subscription because they could effectively buy it using the wealth on their old account. I think this mechanic is really great for certain types of games especially MMOs with open market economies. Now, there are lots of complexities and challenges here, of course, uh, least of all the increased fraud risk. So um, if it's relevant to you, definitely uh, investigate it. Feel free to email me for more information, because uh, if it's right for your game, it can be really, really helpful. OK, so next chapter. Um, now we want to get players to stay for the longer term and find ways to deepen their engagement with the game. Events have a range of benefits that help here. They focus players into certain areas of the game world so they feel more lively and busy. Time-limited events create a sense of urgency to participate, which also helps engagement. And these events are a talking point within the player base, so they create a reason to chat and a reason to socialize. These benefits are great for all types of players, but they're especially beneficial for returners because these are the players that are the less resilient, they're yet to fully engage with your game, and that means they're more vulnerable to churning out. So to be really effective, what you want to do is design events by considering the specific needs of returning players. Um, I've got two types of these events. The first one I call enrichment events. These are when you're trying to deepen the engagement of returners who have lots of time available. These events should give players more stuff to do, encourage them to be social, provide more variety to stop them getting bored. We run these sort of events when the player's free time is higher, which, as I mentioned, was uh, holidays around the summer and the winter. The second type are upkeep events. And this is when you're trying to reduce the disengagement of players who have limited time available. So it's the opposite situation. These events should require minimal time investment from players and offer a lot of value for participating. And ideally encourage players to log in every day, even if only briefly. We do these sorts of events in the leaner months of May and September when some of our players are busy with exams or starting a new school year. And it allows them to keep their connection with the game alive without needing to invest lots of time to feel like they're achieving something. 
I'll give you a couple of examples of these. The first is an enrichment event we ran in RuneScape for uh, Christmas 2013. It was called Up to Snow Good. And uh, players had to complete simple mini games like snowball fights and reindeer herding. And they did this to score points that they could trade in for seasonal festive rewards. It was seasonally themed, lightweight, social, and if players worked together, they could get their rewards faster, so it encouraged them gently to team up and make friends. We found that participation in this event increased the likelihood of retaining a returning player after three months by 9%, so really quite significant. And as a holiday event, we knew that the players' free time would be higher, and so we designed it to help returning players get deeper back into the game. An example of an upkeep event is the uh, September raffle that we ran last year. Um, here, players could log in every day, and they'd get a raffle ticket. They could then use these tickets to enter prize draws throughout the month to win highly desirable items. And there was a bit of a deeper strategy where the players could decide to go all in on that specific prize they wanted, or they could use their tickets more tactically to go into uh, spread their bets, go into less popular draws, so they'd be more likely of getting a prize overall. We found that participation in this event increased the likelihood of retaining a returning player after three months by 11%, so even more effective. By running an upkeep event in September, we're increasing the amount of our summer returners we retain as we go into the leaner months, so it's quite a strategic use of content. These sort of events are great, but you do need to be cautious not to oversaturate the game with them. Um, we found that a one month in three ratio works quite well. Normally our events last uh, a month, and um, this provides enough event coverage, but without burning out your regular players, because these sort of events can be quite draining for the people that are playing all of the time. Obviously, this is very dependent on the type of game, the nature of your community, uh, even the platform. I see a lot of mobile games with weekly or fortnightly events, so they've obviously worked out that's optimal for them. Okay, so final chapter now. So far, I've pro proposed a range of quite specific features or techniques. So in this section, I wanted to talk more about general principles about considering the needs of returning players. Managing the rate of change in online games is really difficult because it's impossible not to want to improve and modernize, especially as your game starts to show its age. The challenge is to balance two competing forces, the benefits you'd get from modernizing the game, but also the benefits you're getting from keeping it familiar and comfortable for players. The risk is that if you change the game too much, uh, you can alienate players who liked it how it was, and that's both for uh, existing and returning players. In my experience, the biggest risk is trying to modernize the core systems of the game rather than adding more content. And I really learned this lesson with RuneScape's 2012 Evolution of Combat update. We felt we needed to overhaul a core gameplay system to keep the game relevant and to continue to attract new players. And there was data to support this because our survey results and onboarding metrics pointed to the somewhat simple low-intensity combat system as a bit of a weak point we overlooked the impact it would have on returning players. We failed in two ways. Firstly, the system itself was too radical a change all at once, and secondly, it was introduced poorly. After the new combat system launched, players were greeted by this pop-up when they logged in. Um, messy UI, two paragraphs of solid text, no useful visuals, only a small call to action button. And if you did click that, you were led to a tutorial that lasted 30 minutes, that honestly was more functional than fun. And worst of all, because some of the item and gear requirements had changed, players had all of their items unequipped and they had to fumble around with their gear before they could continue. So really not good. Um, and you can tell that returning players weren't a big consideration for us here, and we felt the consequences of that. You can see on this chart that the return rate after the launch of the, combat, the new combat system doesn't get the normal seasonal rise. It's the sort of difference between the red and the blue there. For some t returners, the change was simply too great all at once, and they simply stopped coming back. Now, we were fortunate we were able to recover this with the legacy combat mode I mentioned earlier. But it, honestly, if we'd made better decisions, it wouldn't have been needed, and we could have put that effort into other things. By contrast, in early 2012, we launched a feature that could have been similarly disruptive. It was called the Squeal of Fortune. It was a mystery box style mini game where you could uh, spin a prize wheel, um, get things like in-game resources, 
XP boosts or currency. It was a daily login incentives where players were given a couple of free spins every day, but they could also buy uh, additional spins as a microtransaction option. And this was the first time um, to that point in the game's 10-year history when payments beyond the subscription could get you any sort of benefit. And it did cause quite a stir, and there were some complaints, but it actually had zero impact on either our existing or our returning player numbers. And I believe this was because it fundamentally didn't change the core of the game. While some players didn't like it in principle, it was in reality a fairly mild implementation of an MTX feature, and it didn't change the way people played. So of course, you can make changes. You can make big changes even deep into a product's life cycle, but I think caution is needed. So my recommendations for managing change are to alter core gameplay at your peril, undermining the player's mastery, devaluing their achievements, or altering how they fundamentally approach the game can be disastrous if not handled really carefully. When you're considering a big change, do thorough research and testing across all types of players, not just those you're targeting with a specific feature. Give yourself enough time to test and iterate before launch, and give yourself the option to change course if you're seeing warning signals. Also be on the lookout for cumulative change. Again, RuneScape is on the extreme end because we update pretty much every week, but it's something you should keep an eye on even if you've got a lower update cadence. I recommend not just looking at the change per release, but looking at how it's adding up over a longer period. And if you are making a big change, consider whether you can add some sort of backwards compatibility. I mentioned earlier how we re-added RuneScape's old combat and UI in an alternate legacy mode, and I wish we'd included that in the first place. Managing community sentiment is just as important because player satisfaction has a real impact on returners. If the player base are uh, annoyed and outraged, there's going to be less positive word of mouth reaching lapsed players outside the game, and that's going to reduce the number of them likely to return. And inside the game, negative sentiment turns into toxic chatter, and that won't be pleasant for the returners who have made it back into the game, and it will harm their re-engagement. To stay on top of these risks, I, recommending, I recommend finding ways to track community sentiment, to stay aware of how players are feeling, and use it to calibrate your design decisions to do things about it. And we use a number of methods for this, but I'll show you two of the most relevant ones. This first one is a weekly community sentiment report that's put together by our community management team. And it talks about how the players are reacting to that week's new content and events. It shows the split of opinion from players across uh, their game, our forums, the social media, and it calls out specific issues and makes recommendations for addressing them. This gives us a really good short-term view of the issues, the sentiment, and allows us to react quickly when we need to. The other method is a much longer form customer satisfaction tracker. We survey our players every month to see what they think about the game and the service, and it allows us to see the importance of each sub area and how much it affects their future behaviors. So this type of analysis allows us to measure the business impact of player sentiment and how it affects things like recommendations and word of mouth. So maybe it's obvious, but this shows empirically Keeping your customers happy is good for the bottom line, and it will help you getting, in getting and keeping more returning players. I've gone through quite a lot today, so I'll wrap up and recap on the key points. Returners are increasingly important as your game ages, so start building them into your design considerations as early as you can. Utilize social media as a way to communicate with lapsed players on their terms. Don't just rely on email and empower players to get the word out on your behalf. Try to have some game updates designed specifically around the needs of lapsed players and then launch these at the start of seasonal uplifts in returners. Help returners regain their mastery of the game. Don't just leave them to get on with it alone and ideally find ways to give them personalized catch-up. When you've got them playing, deepen their engagement with special community events which are designed sympathetically to their available time. And manage the rate of change cautiously, especially in core gameplay. Keep track of community sentiment and use it to guide your decisions and always keep players as happy as possible. Right, 
that's the end of the talk. Um, thank you so much for coming along today. Please feel free to email me if you want to get hold of these slides or ask any, uh, get some more info on anything. And um, we can now open the floor up to questions if anyone has any. There's uh, mics in all of the aisles. You mentioned you had a companion app. Do you use this in any way to re-engage customers? Uh, does it affect uh, lapsed customer behavior? Do you see people who stop playing RuneScape but still use the companion app to do any engagement activity? So the question was about our companion app and whether it's helped get more returners. Um, not significantly is the answer. Um, the companion app's very much about extending the game experience slightly outside, well, outside of the venue of the game client. Um, and the features are very much only really relevant to very active core players. So um, there might have been some halo effect from it, but not one that we've been able to, to measure when we've looked. Hi there. Uh, your $3 cost of acquiring the returning users, does that include development cost or community management posting on, on Reddit, et cetera, or is that just on? No, that's just paid. So the question was, um, do our costs for user acquisition that I showed include anything other than well, just the raw finance cost. No, that is just, um, that's just spend. Thanks. Hey. Could you cite some s specific examples uh, from your slide about how you engage in the different social platforms versus your email success? Obviously, the Reddit and the YouTube and stuff was significantly more successful. Can you tell us a little bit about the stuff that is successful? I'm concerned about Reddit in particular, but all of it. Like, what's the stuff you do that works well? The question was about... Um, more information on our social channels and why they work well? Um, that's a really good question. I'm not sure of quite the right answer. I think there's just natural, um, sort of a natural dynamic about each of the social media channels that makes it more or less relevant to the characteristics of your player base. Um, Reddit's quite discussion orientated, and our players definitely are very opinionated. I know everyone says that, but like, trust me, our guys really are. Um, I think it's also a place where people pass through a lot more. Um, there's a lot of interlinking inside Reddit, and I think that you don't quite get the same thing on something like Facebook. You do a bit on Twitter, but I'm not sure Twitter triggers returners in quite the same way. Um, yeah, I don't have much more than that, I'm afraid. Hey. So after you introduced the token system that allowed your returners that had the old wealth that you were talking about to purchase subscriptions with their old wealth, did you then find that later them having access to those premium services would give them a taste of what they could get if they paid and then became payers afterwards? So the question was about our bond system that um, allows players to get stuff, uh, premium stuff with their gold, their in-game currency. It, it's a bit of a feeder mechanism. So outside of returners specifically, um, having a tradable premium currency item is really good just as a taster feeder mechanism for all players. So we have seen that it's increased the conversion um, for players in general. Um, I couldn't say specifically about the kind of sub-cohort for returners uh, specifically, but we do see that dynamic um, across the player base. Yeah. Hey. I'm just wondering uh, if you have a forum uh, where players can, do, uh, can discuss basically things with you and with each other, and do you have that in addition to Reddit and Facebook, or did you just pick one or the other? Uh, yeah, no, we've got really big forums. There was a while, uh, so a few years ago now, where our forums were the like, largest, one of the largest traffic sources in the UK. Um, not, quite where it, uh, uh, not quite now, because it's a lot more spread out, but we've always had forums, and they've always had tons of activity. Um, they still have more activity than Reddit, but in terms of players flowing in, our forums are a bit of a bubble, whereas Reddit has a lot of general traffic coming through it, um, so it's a bit more relevant for uh, Get, catching returning players. You mentioned a case where you introduced some change that caused a stir um, and negative response, but didn't have an effect on the players. Have you found any patterns where you know something will cause drama, but won't cause a drop in numbers and vice versa? So the question was about the difference between features that might cause a stir, but don't change uh, like player activity or subscription numbers. Um, I mean, I'm coming to this stuff retrospectively, of course. Like, you can probably tell that we didn't have all this wisdom in the first place. We, I could really just go back to the, the stuff I was talking about in terms of best practice. 
we do a lot more pre-research now. Um, when we launched that legacy mode that I talked about, we flew about 40 players into our studio, took them through the concept of it, allowed them to play an early version, because we knew it would be quite controversial, not among the people we'd alienated, but of the people that were still playing and liked the new thing. Um, so um, I think we're getting a better feel for it, but research, um, just communication with your player base, being really honest with them, um, that's, that's the way we're, we've, we, what we've done to um, get better at that. Hi, um, I'm curious how you uh, prioritize developer time for um, some of these extra solutions that you come up with for returners versus giving the player, the, your existing players something new and shiny, basically. So the question was about how we prioritize and divide time between um, content for our, uh, regular players versus returners. Um, what we try and do is create a fairly sizable update um, at each of those returner peaks, so early summer and Christmas, and we kind of do events in um, Halloween is a smaller version of that. That's probably, I don't know, like a fifth or a sixth of our overall resource. Because we have, we've got a really big team and, and company, so um, we're a very, very content-driven game, so we release something every week. So if there's maybe three weeks of the year where we're releasing a fairly big update for returners, that still pales in comparison to all of the other content that we're pushing out every week for everyone else. So it's still a small minority. You mentioned a lot of things ranging from game design to community management. Where is the line drawn between this is the community management's job for getting return player, this is something we need design somebody to design an event for? How do you differentiate between the different roles? Or do you have a specific team just for retention and uh, getting returners? So the question was about the where the line between community management and development and design uh, falls. We've really benefited from integrating our teams. There are separate teams for community management. We have a community development team who are kind of a mixture of developers and community managers. And then we have like retention orientated development teams as well. We try and get everyone to mix as much as possible, but ultimately, it's the, and we have loads of our developers on Twitter and things like that, but ultimately it's the community manager's job, official job, to do the um, official communication, run events, that kind of thing. And for our developers, it's more of a thing we like to encourage them to do and that they actually really enjoy as well. Um, but I suppose in reality, the lines are the ones you'd expect, but um, we have our developers sitting right next to our community managers. We've done, we've really improved things by integrating our publishing and development functions to sit right next to each other and talk a lot and plan a lot together. So um, we try and blur the line, but it's, it's, it's also probably where you expect it to be. Hey. Hi. How much work do you guys do around the old school servers uh, in, um, in terms of like events that you um, keep pace with the, the uh, normal servers? Or do you um, just do small bug fixes and things like that? And then how big is the team dedicated to, to old school? Um, so the question was about uh, the attention we put into our retro servers. Um, it's, so it's a lot smaller than that of the main game. Um, it's a really dedicated, so we, it's a, so we treat it as a sub-product um, in the way that we have sub-retention teams and, and technology teams. It's a legit team of its own that's fully resourced, but smaller than that of the main team. They run all their own events, they have their own content. There's, it's interesting actually, when you do a retro service, um, part of the reason it's there is to provide this old way of playing and this kind of, there's a natural conservatism about it. So we've actually got a, like a constitution for our retro servers that says we don't make any change unless the majority of players have voted for it, even the smallest thing. Obviously like bugs and exploits discounted, but um, that means that it's, it only moves at the rate of the majority of the players. And it means it's a very conservative old style thing, but that's like exactly why it exists. Um, but yeah, we treat it as a, a legit service that you know, we expect it to run for decades more. Thanks. Hi. On a freemium model, a business model, it seems um, hard to define laps. Uh, at what point do you de uh, determine the, a player being laps, and what's, what worked the best for you? To, on wh which moment did you get the feedback from them? Um, so um, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about how we define lapsed players as people who've been away for over three months. They've been out of subscription, but most people it would be a month of inactivity. Um, in terms of reaching out to them in uh, like surveys and stuff, 
Um, we obviously collected all of the, people have to sign up to our game uh, with an account. Um, they can use social media accounts as well. So we always have a point of contact for everyone. We make sure we validate their email address for customer services and payment and stuff like that. Um, so when we do surveys to LAPS players, we are looking at people generally who've been away, I mean, at least three months, but probably deeper than that into um, six months because they're more likely to remember just those important things rather than sort of a cacophony of other comments. Okay? Great. Okay. Um, I think we're done. Thank you so much, everyone.